If you just picked up a Panasonic mirrorless camera or have no idea how to use one, then you're in luck. In this video, I'll be breaking down how to use this Lumix G7. However, if you have any other camera system, what I'm gonna tell you in this video will apply to you as well. It's surprising how often beginners use the wrong settings when shooting video, so you're definitely not gonna wanna miss this. Hey, what's going on guys? C Santos here, and this channel is all about helping you and inspiring you to create content with whatever means necessary. So if you're interested and learning about technology, gear, or other ways you can create content, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Now, out of the box, most cameras, including the G7, are ready for you to shoot video. However, they are set to automatically adjust everything that's important when it comes to shooting really good video. The shutter speed, the ISO, and all of that is set to automatically adjust with no input from you. You can mainly start shooting video with all the settings set to auto. But should you? In some cases like vlogging, it may be necessary for you to leave some of these settings in auto. However, there are still some things that you need to know in order for you to take full advantage of the camera sensor in order for you to create the best picture possible for your video. Now to get started, we need to cover a few things about this camera. Now, if you don't have this specific camera, don't worry. Some of the buttons and callouts that I'm gonna mention are on your camera, you just need to look for them. They might be within the sub menus of the camera or in a different position that I'm gonna mention in this video. Now it's important for you to understand what each button does before getting started. The power switch. This turns the camera on and off. The mode dial, which allows you to switch between movie and photography mode. The drive mode dial. This dial has no function in video mode, so you don't need to worry about this. The motion picture button. This is what allows you to record video. The AF and AE lock. The focus mode lever. This allows you to switch between different autofocus functions. The shutter button, which also acts as a record button in video. The aperture control. The shutter control. Display, which allows you to switch the displays on the screen. The menu button, which takes you to the menus. ISO. White balance. Function one two, three, four, and five. There are 10 things you need to understand out of all the things I mentioned in order for you to begin to master this camera and honestly, any other camera system out there. And the first is navigation. Now, in order to fully understand the rest of this video, you're going to need to get acquainted with navigation. This is honestly the most important thing and probably the thing that makes people not want to touch their camera ever again. Most video cameras have complex navigation when trying to change a simple setting. Sony, for example, is notorious at this. So once you have a hang of navigating through the menus, you, we can now begin on the second thing, which is resolution. Now to begin, you need to understand that this camera has the ability to shoot 4K, as well as 1080p HD and 720SD. If you wanna take full advantage of the sensor in this camera, you're going to always want to shoot in 4K. Now the third thing is frame rates. Now if you didn't notice while selecting your resolution, there are also options for you to select certain frame rates. When shooting 4K, you have the option to choose 23.976 or 29.976. 23.976 is known as a cinematic frame rate. A lot of your favorite films are captured in this frame rate. 29.976 is widely used in television. Some of your favorite television shows were shot in 29 frames per second. No, God! If if you want to shoot cinematic content or short films, I would recommend using 23.976. This is the cinema standard. Now for most interviews and even my YouTube videos, for example, have been shot in 29 frames per second. I highly recommend you use this frame rate when shooting your videos. Now shooting in 23.976 doesn't mean your footage is cinematic. At the end of the day, this all depends on what you create using this medium to tell your story. Same goes for any other frame rate you choose, even on higher end cameras. Now, if you want to shoot slow-mo, you can only do that in 1080p HD. Now the third thing, ISO. ISO stands for the International Organization for Standardization, an organization that sets international standards for all different kinds of measurements, but when in reference to your camera, the ISO is your camera's sensitivity to light. Now one thing to understand, that every camera has a different negative ISO. In short, this is the ISO level that produces the least amount of noise to signal ratio. Specifically for the G7 through the G100, this is 200. So the higher the ISO, the more noise your image will have. There are some scenarios where you will have to raise your ISO because you cannot control the amount of light in the room or in the scenario where you're shooting. Just be aware that your image is going to produce more noise. 
The fourth thing, the f-stop. The f and f-stop stands for focal length. While focal length themselves refers to the field of view of the lens, the f-stop is about how much light is hitting your lens via the aperture opening. The aperture is the hole in the middle of the lens made up of rotating blades that open in order to let light in. The diameter of the aperture determines how much light gets through and thus how bright your exposure will be. Now the fifth thing, shutter speed. Shutter speed is exactly what it sounds like. It's the speed at which the shutter of the camera open and closes. For beginners, just remember this rule of thumb to keep in mind, your shutter speed should be double your frame rate. Now this rule you don't have to follow all the time. There are some cases where you need to have a higher shutter speed in the case of shooting on a green screen like I do, where you actually want to reduce the motion blur of the image if there is a lot of movement involved. But in most cases, you wanna keep it twice the frame rate. If you have it lower, you're going to have very choppy footage, especially if there's a lot of movement involved. However, there is an artistic aspect to using a lower shutter. In the case of shooting at night, for example, if you have a, your shutter at one over 30, you can actually achieve a brighter image. Now for beginners, it's easy to ignore the rest of what I'm gonna say, but if you can understand these next steps, it's going to help you tremendously in the long run. And now let's talk about histograms. A histogram is a graph that displays brightness along the horizontal axis, black to white, and the number of pixels at each brightness level on the vertical axis. It allows you to easily check a picture's exposure. These graphs are extremely useful for you not to overexpose your scene or the subject you're filming. It's extremely easy to underexpose or overexpose your image, which is why you always want to EETR. I will dive more in depth in a video all about this and why it's important, but in short, EETR stands for exposed to the right. In manual shutter and aperture mode, you can manipulate the image however you like, but if you keep your camera in auto like some may do, for example, if you're vlogging, you just want the camera to do all the heavy lifting and you don't have to worry about this at all. Now the exposure meter. This meter is displayed at the bottom of the display based on what metering mode you have selected. This meter tells you how bright the light is that's being reflected back into the camera. When your camera is set to the default settings out of the box like mine is, this meter is set to multi-metering mode, which for beginners is great. It's just taking the overall brightness of the image and letting you know in the values if it's dark or bright. Keep in mind that histograms are better at telling you whether your image is correctly exposed, but you can use the exposure meter as a great starting point. Now, zebras. Zebras are these visual guides. They let you know what's being overexposed. This is one of the most overlooked settings for beginners. In order to activate zebras, you're going to need to go into the submenu and find zebras and turn zebras on. Zebras help tremendously when you're filming in bright situations and you need to make sure that skin tones are not overexposed. And finally, color profile. Now when you're starting off shooting, I would highly recommend starting off with the standard or vivid color profiles. This makes it easier for you to understand the camera as well as all the settings involved with filming. Once you master this camera, you can begin looking at the advanced features, which again, I will create a separate video on and will be linked in my description. So I highly recommend that you watch that to fully understand some other key features that I did not mention in this video for beginners. If you made it this far into the video, I congratulate you. So many people don't take the time to understand their equipment and their gear. There are so many other tips and features specifically on this camera and any other camera that can be mentioned in another video that's way more advanced than this one. Now, if you found this video helpful, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. The mission of my channel is to help you and inspire you to create content with whatever means necessary, whether that's with technology, gear, or other ways of creating content. If you want to support this channel in any other way, have a look at the links in the description of this video. They are affiliate links, so I do get a kickback for any purchases made through those links. Thank you guys for watching. As always, have a great day.